On the latest episode of Getting to Know Jew, we speak with Mark Edelman. Edelman is the founder and president of the Theater League, a theater management company that has been bringing Broadway shows and all manner of other performances to Kansas City for over 40 years. We talk about a new arts management program named after him and what it's like being a matzo brie and gefilte fish kind of Jew. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Lib. So I want to ask you about the new arts management program at the University of Minis- of Missouri, Kansas City. I almost said Minnesota. I'm so sorry. Um, and the program is named after you. But first, let's start with the Theater League, an organization you founded but no longer lead, which gave the $1 million grant to create the arts management program. For listeners who may not know this, the story behind it, why did you create the Theater League and what potential did you see and do you see in Kansas City for theater? Well, back in the uh, mid-70s, mid uh, I was working in the theater. I was running a theater uh, in New Hope, Pennsylvania, a stock theater called the Bucks County Playhouse. And as part of my uh, duties, I got the weekly uh, variety. That's the publication for, for performing arts. And there was a section on theater and a, a particular uh, story each week about the box office records uh, for for what they called the road, theaters outside of New York where national tours were presented. And I noticed that Cincinnati and Columbus and Louisville were all on there, but Kansas City wasn't. Kansas City was the same size town. I felt it had the requisite cultural identity to support these kinds of shows, especially if those other cities did. So I I sought out the producers of, actually the first show was Greece, uh, the Broadway musical that a long time was the longest running show. And I called that producer and he said, uh, yeah, we, we could come to Kansas City. So I said, well, please do. And I'll present you here. And that was the beginning of the Theater League. That was in 1977. And the following, in May of 77, and the following fall, we presented the first uh, series of five musicals then at the Lyric Theater. Uh, and the uh, linchpin or the, 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 the big draw of that season was the first presentation in Kansas City of a chorus line, not for one night, not for two nights, but for three weeks. And my mother told me, shows don't play three weeks, Mark. You know, you might be, you might have a one night, you know, one night, you know, here and there. But I explained to her, no, mom, that that's not how it's done anymore. Although the people that have been doing in Kansas City do it that way, there's a you know, kind of a renaissance in touring Broadway and, and I want to be part of it. And that began the theater league. And what, I mean, could you say a little bit more about what particularly, why Kansas City? You know, I, I think I read as part of your biography, you moved to New York City for a time and were working there. You know, why not just stay in New York City and see theater there? You know, what made you want to bring this back to Kansas City and, and serve the community? Well, the, there are a lot of people that produce theater in New York City, all of them with more money and experience and probably smarter than me. Uh, but uh, no one was doing it in Kansas City, and that was my hometown, my even when I was in New York City, I, uh, my wife, you know, my girlfriend there at the time, later my wife, uh, lived in Kansas City, and we all grew up there, and that was the place to do shows. Uh, nobody else was had spoken for the marketplace at that point, so I got involved there. No opportunity for me in New York other than, a, you know, a mm-hmm. nine-to-five job or for someone else in Kansas City. I could be the guy who made the difference, and uh, I hope for many years I was able to do that. So how does it feel to, you know, after all your work, to now have this arts management program named after you and kickstarted by the organization you founded? And how are you hoping the program changes or affects the future of arts in Kansas City? Well, just as back in the 70s, I started a nonprofit performing arts organization. Uh, Many others uh, among my peers did the same thing. None of us had any experience to speak of in the management uh, financing, marketing, or, uh, or leadership of these entities. We just were we were shooting from the hip, playing by the seat of our pants. Um, and I felt that uh, the next generation of arts managers after me, because I've retired, uh, could profit by having a program uh, in which the uh, many, many not-for-profit uh, management offerings at the Block School could be tied to uh, the uh, conservatory and a special uh, internship program 
where students who express an interest in this sort of career uh, got actual hands-on experience working at the symphony, at the opera, the ballet, the ramp, uh, American Theater Guild, uh, Dinner Theater, the various performing arts organizations. So they learned how to do it while they were taking classes in performing arts management, human resources, finance, marketing, development, all those areas that I never, I did, I never studied. My, my staff, my staff was lucky I didn't uh, shoot myself or them because I really didn't know any better about managing people. I just had to hope, you know, for the best. It'd be nice for people to have that kind of uh, textbook learning and tie it to experience in major performing arts organizations. So when they get out, of the graduate certificate program. They'll not only have an MBA or an MFA, but they'll also have this certificate in performing arts management, which hopefully will get them a, a, a job and will round out the ranks of the next generation of performing arts managers. Are there any sort of trends in the arts or in theater in Kansas City that you're hoping sort of the the next generation, the people who succeed you, um, either I don't know, uh, continue to curate or look out for or anything in particular you're hoping that they follow up on in terms of those trends? Well, uh, I think the theater is, is um, unlike the opera, uh, or even, well, I mean, the symphony is too, but the theater is, is still reaching out to a younger and younger audience. You know, we're not, uh, we're not going to, you know, die when there are the dinosaurs in our audience uh, retire because young people are coming in and there's new works uh, that are exciting and being generated in New York and elsewhere. For a younger audience, I hope that uh, this management program, which is, after all, for young people, you know, people just starting their careers, will bring to the fore kind of managers who will be excited by this kind of program. And just as I was excited by Annie and A Chorus Line and Cats and Phantom and Les Mis, some shows that people think are passe, but that's what I grew up with. I, that's my 30s, shows that I got to produce and present. So I hope that happens. Uh, trends, um, social media has become such a dominant part of the marketing uh, of theater and dance and music. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I think it's important that people learn all about that. I don't know very much about it. When I started, you put an ad in something called the Kansas City Star. I mean, I don't know if anybody even reads that anymore, but uh, that's all it took, the Sunday Kansas City Star. And you gave them the ad and you you were off to the races. You also bought ads on radio stations. I don't know if people do that anymore. Television stations, I guess they still see those. But it's uh, become a, a, a social media world and learning about that in a, in a marketing sense and also in the hands-on experience in some of these groups would be valuable. And speaking of young people, you know, for younger listeners who may be undecided on their future career path, you know, if you're speaking directly to them, what's your pitch to say, okay, get involved in this. This is the thing that you should be doing. Well, the elevator pitch for the program was the following. How many students are studying in the master's degree program for in dance, theater, and music at the conservatory? The answer, a 300. How many people are studying the management of the organizations those 300 people are going to be asking for a job? The answer and prior to the certificate program, zero. So uh, this, this program is for the, is for the MBA uh, student who really doesn't want to go to work for a bank or an insurance company. It's for the MFA student, the, you know, the, the oboe player who's probably not going to get that first chair oboe in a major symphony, but still would like to, one, stay involved in the arts, and two, raise a family. Because these, sadly, I'm embarrassed to say so, but I, mean, I made a lot of money uh, as a performing arts manager, and no one ever paid to see me do anything on stage. You know, the, the, the executives, the management that they do in this day and age, they, they, they do make a nice living where actors and musicians are kind of in kind of in the gig economy. They have to, uh, you know, scrounge for this and that, teach and stuff. It's not fair. And I'm hoping that the performing arts managers that come out of our program, when they get to lead organizations, will recognize this and say, no, we have to, we have to pay our actors more than we pay the girl answering the phone. I also want to sort of zoom out a little bit and ask how your Judaism and Jewishness has influenced your work in theater. My understanding is that your mom was a Holocaust survivor, and a year ago you also helped curate a show about different genocides, including the Holocaust for the Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away exhibition. 
Yes. Uh, well, my mother, my mother was, she was, she was a survivor to the extent that she got out before everything. My mother did not, didn't go to a camp. My grandfather went to Buchenwald just as a, as a, as a, uh, you know, to register, but then they got out because they had money and they knew, and my, my great uncle actually worked for the Jewish agency. So he, he knew people and they were, they were able to get to, uh, to Cuba where they were allowed to land. The next boat that went to Cuba, the St. Louis, was not allowed to land. So they were, they were lucky in that regard. But, um, you know, Jews are, have been in the performing arts, you know, and comedy and music for, you know, as long as uh, there have been Jews. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of following in that, uh, in that cultural foot, you know, uh, footpath. I mean, I am not, a, I don't believe in God. I'm a, I think, a cultural Jew. Uh, I believe in matzah, bry, and uh, filterfish, not God. But uh, that I think that informs you. And, and, and as a, and I grew up in a in an industry where much of the leadership was uh, was Jewish. I mean, the Schubert organization was run by Jerry Schoenfeld and Bernie, you know, Bernie Jacobs and the Needlelanders and all these, all the all the the big producers, uh, 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 except for David Merrick. Uh, were you know were Jewish, and so there was sort of a natural uh, 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 ability to you know participate you know in that, and you know you didn't have to kind of prove yourself. In in many ways, Jews, of course, have to prove themselves in many many careers. I mean, they were ostracized or you know kept out of you know medical schools and uh, and you know participation in you know some banking enterprises. But not in the not in the theater, not in show business. We're 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 the majority there, and that I'm sure held me in some good stead. And just being, you know, being open to new ideas, and you know, being, uh, I mean, uh, you know, as the outsider, you're, you know, you have to be more accepting of you know new things around you. I think that maybe had something to do with it. Although I don't know. Did that play into, um, there have been sort of audiences in Kansas City that have walked out of certain show and a chorus line was, uh, of course, continues to be in some places of the country still very controversial. Did that sort of willingness to be more accepting of, of more diverse viewpoints and, and new things and that kind of thing sort of, uh, how did that play into the kind of experiences you were trying to bring to Kansas City? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I've always, you know, I mean, I made the mistake when I did Greece. In 1981, to opening the Starlight Theater season, where I produced the first season there that had been locally produced in like decades, and the director came to me and said, "Do you want the original?" And I blithely said, "Sure." And then I saw like 50, 60, 70 people a night walking out because they say, "What, what, what the fuck are you doing?" You know, and uh, I probably should have rethought that decision, but but I've, I mean, I always believed that you know it was my job to present you know the the act you know the the what the author had in mind i'm not i am not going to edit you know the author and and when a play wins the tony or is you know highly highly regarded around the country i felt it was appropriate for me to present it even though you know, sometimes it's disturbing to an audience i mean we're we're we, the theater league was always on the well far side of the commercial spectrum you know that the unicorn was on the opposite side let's say but we still had some controversies, and I, it was not my intention to steer clear of those or, or edit a play. I can't. I'm not allowed to. Can, can I also ask, I mean, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, you know, again, with this sort of new arts management program, but your family has sort of a longstanding relationship with the, the university, right? Because I, my understanding is, you know, you and, and your brothers, I believe, sort of established a program in honor of your mother to, to help other refugees be able to get an education as well. Can you speak a little bit to sort of that relationship with the university? And because it feels like there's a little more meaning, it's already meaningful to have this, this arts management program, but uh, it seems they're being added meaning of sort of the longstanding family relationship. Right, yeah, the, the, and you mentioned earlier that the program was named for me. It's actually named for my family because we were the, uh, the uh, alumni legacy award winner in 2020, and we had to put off the recognition of that, of course, during COVID. So this is to some extent recognition of that. Yeah, we, my my brother and nephew went to law school at UMKC. My mother got her undergraduate degree there. My father got a master's in psychology there. But we were always you know, involved uh, there. When I was, uh, 
a law student, I, I ran the uh, what was then the uh, citywide symposium, the RFK, Robert F. Kennedy's Memorial Symposium, which brought in speakers like John Dean and Elliot Richardson in the midst of Watergate, uh, Ralph Nader, you know, uh, you know, leaders uh, of in different fields to speak at uh, uh, on campus. But of course, it's a it's a it's a what they call a streetcar campus. So really, everybody it was for everybody in town. Um, I also presented you know concerts like uh, like um, 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 the Manhattan Transfer, you know, at the Uptown, all under the auspices of the university. Like the first touring play I ever presented was in 1974. Um, it was a play called The National Lampoon Lemmings, uh, which was an off-Broadway musical that uh, had originated the Village Gate in New York. And I presented it you know, under the auspices of the University Program Council at UMKC at the musical, uh, sold it out. And I remember my mother uh, t- taking a whiff of the air in there and said, Mark, what are they smoking in here? Imagine you could smoke at the musical, let alone marijuana. But uh, after that show, the cast of the, the cast of Lemmings came over to our apartment at 44th Moment. We had a little party there. Um, I don't remember the women in the cast, but the three men were John Belushi, Chris Guest, and Chevy Chase. So they were all in our apartment uh, uh, getting high. That sounds like quite a party. Wow. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, like, what were... Uh, theater is uh, is obviously an industry in a place where you know literally anything could happen in the moment. What's sort of your favorite the disaster that was averted story, the disaster that could have been? Well, um, well, we were doing Annie at the Midland, and suddenly smoke poured out of the ceiling, and we thought the place was on fire. So uh, the woman who played Grace Farrell, you know. Uh, Daddy Warbuck's secretary. Uh, she noticed that she was on stage, and so she looked up. And she said, "She said, now, there may be a fire." I mean, she just announced this: there may be a fire, but everybody carefully and you know, uh, uh, without rushing, get up and exit the theater. It was raining outside, so it wasn't an easy place to get. Uh, but uh, she engineered that, and in fact, in return for that, she got like an award from the fire department. Um, people waited outside for an hour or two. Then they discovered it wasn't anything more than the fan. Something had sparked next to a fan. So the fan just, you know, just billowed out, you know, the smoke. And nothing was on fire, just that it happened to have been near the exhaust fan or the uh, intake fan. The next line in the play, when they came back to the same spot, uh, Daddy Warbucks, it's the scene where they're about to go visit New York. Daddy Warbucks says, Smell that Fifth Avenue bus fumes. <laughs> Pretty funny right after the fire. Um, we had, uh, you know, little things like that, you know, you know happen from uh, time to time. Thankfully, the show must go on and people uh, manage to uh, put their best foot forward. That's always been a, it's been fun to be part of that, uh, I guess, fraternity or that industry because, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, everybody gets the job done. Can I also ask, is it true that you saw every single Broadway show last year? I missed two. I saw 38 of the 40 Broadway shows. I'm a, I'm a Tony voter, so it's much easier for me to go because I get the tickets for free. Uh, but uh, my wife was always uh, really dedicated. She said, you got to see all the shows if you're going to vote, even though most people didn't. Um, so she was, uh, and plus she loved theater. So we went to, we usually saw 40, 40 shows a year. Uh, at least. How do you uh, sort of differentiate? I feel like at a certain point of just seeing that many shows over a career as long as yours, like how do you sort of remember and differentiate between so many different elements of... Well, there are forgettable shows and there are very memorable shows. Uh, when you, you know, as we did, when you see eight or nine shows in a week, yeah, by the end of the week, you're getting a little tired, but then you see something you'll never forget. I've had the good fortune of, uh, I spent time in New York. I go to the Lincoln Center Library, where you can watch the only ar- officially archived version of some of these shows. And I often go back and see, watch a show that I got to see for the first time because it was so exciting, so thrilling. I mean, it's, it's, it's unclear to me. I mean, I love baseball, but I mean, you know, I mean, most guys don't go to the theater. I was, I was wondering, I mean, 
I mean, the theater is so thrilling. I mean, and, and everybody's there to thrill you. I mean, you go to a Royals game and you could be just be depressed, you know, or like, oh God, you know, this mistake was made. On stage, everybody is working to, to you know, to meet the author and the director's uh, expectation. And when that expectation is high, you are, it's really exciting. But, you know, people miss the theater. I mean, obviously it's expensive and some people don't get free tickets, but uh, I think you show anytime. Um, just, you know, for listeners, could you give a taste of sort of what, um, you know, the community, Jewish community in Kansas City can expect from the theater league or, or shows coming up in the near future? Well, you know, all the great Broadway shows are going to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we have two stages, the musical and the Kaufman to host them now. Uh, the, the Moulin Rouge and uh, the next great shows that come down the pike, uh, we'll, be, we'll be playing, uh, Kansas City, I'm sure I, uh, there's been a new Neil, speaking of Jewish performers, there's a new Neil Diamond musical called Beautiful Noise that's coming that I think is going to really be exciting and, and talk not only about his musical career, but being raised Jewish in Brooklyn. You know, uh, and I'd like to think of it, instead of Jersey Boys, it's Italian. This is Brooklyn Boy, and he's Jewish. But a lot of great shows. Every year, there's, you know, there's people in New York creating they love theater and creating new works. And thankfully, their, their stock is still worth something. So they're willing to invest. So the last question I have for you is sort of a classic one for this podcast. What is your favorite part of the Kansas City Jewish community? All my friends. Uh, you know, I mean, I grew up uh, you know, at Beth Shalom. My kids went to the academy. And so although we were never, never participated, my wife and, and, and I, in uh, in in congregational membership, uh, we uh, we were involved in institutions again, like the academy. My wife ran the annual um, uh, AFS Shabbat, which were, which which uh, invited foreign exchange students who were visiting Kansas City to 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 be involved to come to dinner with a Jewish family, and that was always a big part of our year. Um, and you know, what, going to the theater. I mean, Jews are a big part of the audience. You know, much 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 more than their percentage. I mean, if the Jews of Kansas City are, uh, let's see, let's see, there's 25,000 Jews and two and a half million people. If, they, if they're 1% of the population, they are 20%, 30% of the theater. So, uh, you know, you, 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 I, I, I couldn't go to a show and not see somebody I knew. The Getting to Know Jew podcast is a product of the Kansas City Jewish Chronicle and the Jewish Federation of Greater Kansas City. It is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network and produced by Jew Folk Inc. Please rate, review, subscribe, and share. If you have suggestions for future guests, please email the show at webmaster at jewishkc.org.